as you could taste this evening that a lot of what we have to cultivate is really beyond questions and answers. And yet we also have to get our act together on every plane. And a lot of it involves just keep asking the questions and answering them to ourselves until we run out. So this part is where we do that. And uh, we just keep reaching for the truth together because that's really the highest thing we can offer each other. That's the way we help each other get free. Just be here now. Just be here now. Hey everyone, Raghu and I'm back with Ramdas here and now. And with me today is my close associate and part of the foundation and heads up our fellowship in education and diversity, Jackie Dobrinska. Hi, Jackie. Hi there. Hi. Nice so, to be here with you all. And many of you already know Jackie through some of the other work that she does, wonderful work uh, with our courses, with the fellowships and all the different wonderful fellowships uh, that we do. So here's the deal. We are, Jackie is going to take over the lead of telling you all a little bit of what's going on so you're uh, clued in to some of the things that the foundation is doing around uh, all of the offerings that we have. So she's going to take care of that. And what we're going to be doing going forward, and I'm going to leave this to Jackie in this moment, because what we are doing is she has these wonderful fellowships. This will give you a little bit of a prompt to sign up to our general fellowship. And Jackie, just tell us what you're doing with these fellowships related to the uh, bi-monthly Ramdas talks. Yeah, so the fellowship is really a place to come together for spiritual community, which I think so many of us are hungry for right now. And I think it's I think you were the one that told me that this is something Ramdas really wanted to see into the future was that satsang would continue. So what we've been doing, and we just started doing it this way, where a week after the episode airs, we get together in community to talk about the the content as well as meditate and chant together. But we're changing that a little bit in the fact that you're going to start joining us and we're going to have dialogue and Q&A and all sorts of good stuff. So it'll be a richy, richer, juicier um, fellowship. Yeah, and a, and a great exploration because the way that we come together and that's what satsang is all about. We all, have, we all see, thring, see things through that special individual eye that's part of the collective. And uh, so we're going to share that. That seemed much more reasonable to me. I've been doing the uh, intros for the last few years, obviously. Uh, it's been a joy. And at the same time, it was missing the kind of feedback with people where I'm, you know, and I hate being pedantic and just going on about what I, how I hear what Ram Dass is talking about. Yes, I have been hearing it for a very long time. So uh, certainly that was part of the advantage of me doing them to let people know what was involved and uh, what Ramdas was bringing up and what were some of the more important points that I felt that people could really look to. So in this way, we'll be doing it together. And I'm happy to join Jackie and the fellowship to do this. So that is the raison d'etre for this joint little uh, uh, intro to this podcast from Ramdas, And I, I guess uh, you have a date, so let's talk about the date. Yeah. So I also want to say that the first half of these will be sort of interacting as a group Q&A. And then the second half, we're still going to have our breakout rooms where we get to connect as a community. Um, and people, I get so many emails and calls about people feeling a little bit nervous about joining and having conversations with people they don't know. And every single time people are like, oh my gosh, that went away in about 10 seconds. So I really invite people to come and be a part. Um, so the next one is August 2nd and it's at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So what how it, the pattern is, is that 
the fellowship will happen a week after each op- episode airs, but the time changes. So one week, it'll be three o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so we can connect with the European EU um, and UK folks. And then the f- next time, it'll be 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so we can get the West Coast and um, mm. California and That's Hawaii cool. folks. So, I like that. No. That's great. Yeah. So uh, if you're not part of the fellowship, where do they go, Jackie, to sign up? They go to, yeah, ramdas.org slash fellowship. You'll see a calendar with not only these fellowships, but all of our other groups, as well as a form where you can sign up. And then you'll get the invitations and the links that way. And there's much more going on. There's individual fellowships that are around women's issues, LGBTQ, uh, Spanish. Uh, now yeah. we're doing something BIPOC. with BIPOC. We're doing something with Google around workplace. Uh, so there's, a there's many fellowship. Yeah. yeah. So it's pretty rich, and and you can take advantage of whatever your proclivity might be of interest, shall we say? So uh, do join up, though, uh, in this especially. Uh, being able to share what Ramdas is uh, talking about and uh, and through our own personal lens is uh, that's a wonderful thing and real satsang. So mm-hmm. happy to have you uh, be doing this and happy to join it. And uh, the only other thing I want to say right here is, uh, and we're talking about the different offerings that we make, and there's one that's coming up in August called Whisper of the Heart. Uh, uh, whisper in the heart, isn't that the title? Yeah, yeah whisper yeah, in the, the heart, which is stories of Neem Karoli Baba and his interactions with people uh, after he left that body and that blanket. And uh, it's a wonderful book by Parvati Marcus, and uh, it's uh, it's going to be available in the middle of August. And right now you can pre-order it. That'll help us with getting more visibility out there through Amazon and everybody else. Uh, so I wanted to mention that. Anything else, Jackie? That's it? No, it just feels really exciting um, to be getting together. And I'm not sure that we were really clear about this. So I just want to say, you know, each of these fellowship calls will be discussing the podcast, right? So it's really great if you listen to the podcast before you come. Oh, yeah, that'll and, help. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, come anyway. Um, right. Because through the conversation, people will get things out of it. Yeah. When I come on, I'll introduce some of the things that I think are, are the most interesting about what Ramdas has to say about it, it, so many varied subjects and how amazing yeah. he is. So... Mm-hmm. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jackie. We look forward to the, this new uh, offering from Love, Serve, Remember Foundation. And this is Ram Das here and now on Be Here Now Network. Go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and find that wonderful plethora of fantastic teachers and thought leaders. And uh, Jackie's introducing this whole uh, uh, a new podcast, which you can find in the near future which uh, we got together with uh, the Ojai Foundation and we're going to, well, they have some incredible uh, speakers and talks from back in the day, what they were doing here in Ojai, where we are, uh, not Jackie, where I am. And uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to that as well. So we shall see you next time. Thank you. As you could taste this evening that A lot of what we have to cultivate is really beyond questions and answers. And yet we also have to get our act together on every plane. And a lot of it involves just keep asking the questions and answering them to ourselves until we run out. So this part is where we do that. And uh, we just keep reaching for the truth together because that's really the highest thing we can offer each other. That's the way we help each other get free. So any questions? I will take and repeat and play with. How did I get to be so brilliant? (laughs) Well, it's interesting because I... Because I'm really not brilliant. Um, I'm not a scholar at all. It's just that as I get emptier, 
the way the words come together seems much easier. It just keeps flowing. It's like, it's like tuning into a reservoir of some sort. You know, like Einstein said, I didn't arrive at my understanding of the fundamental laws through my rational mind. He, his mind became one-pointed and he went through into a place where it all is. And then he came back and he was Albert and he was a good physicist. So he brought back E equals MC squared. And Bach goes through and brings back the Brandenburg Concerto. Mozart doesn't even go in and out. He just keeps the door open and copies it as fast as he can, you know. <laughs> but it, and he's just a scribe, if you will. And in a way, I feel like I'm a mouth for stuff that has nothing to do with me particularly. I really sit here most of the time just, isn't this interesting? Pleasant evening, fascinating, just watching it all pass. So I have no identity with any of this stuff. You're not going to bad trip me. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Oh, absolutely. He asked if I feel it's a value to do formal meditation. In fact, I will undoubtedly go back and do a lot more of it because um, there's a different kind of depth of examination of the way in which the mind works. Um, and I've noticed that over the, uh, let's see, 70, 16 years that I've been meditating formally, that in the first years when I'd meditate, I would end up after a long meditation, somewhat dry, and then I'd be very drawn to bhakti or devotional practices to open my heart again, or back in the life, or, you know. Now that doesn't happen. When I meditate, by the time I finish, I, there's a very soft moistness about it all, even though as I get empty. And it's interesting, I feel like I'm meditating from a different space now where I start from, so that I see over the years the meditative practice instead of something that I was doing from a place that it, I said it was the practice that's making me dry, but it was me that was making dry. So I'm experiencing changes as the years go by. And I see that as really, uh, it's not my major method, but it's certainly uh, the quieting of the mind is the key part of it, yeah. Well, see, the thing that's bizarre, I mean, not, is understandable, is that there's no form. So the form just keeps emerging out of the situation. And then it keeps going back into the void. And there's no, um, uh, you see, if we, we could like go into a deeper silence, but it's very fine when it gets to spiritual materialism where you're starting to try to get high off the moment. And in a way, what I'm saying is it's nothing special. It's nothing special. It's just common, ordinary moment. It's as if you're just appreciative of the fullness of the moment, but you're not, the form doesn't have to be special anymore. So uh, I don't know how, really, to do it more than this yet. Okay? I imagine there'll be a time when we'll all come together and that we might sit silently for three hours and walk out and say, profound evening. It doesn't feel like we're quite ready for that yet, okay? <laughs> I don't know any other form to do it in. Yes. My major vehicle is my relation to my guru. It's called Guru Kripa. And uh, that all has a kind of a mystique quality, and that's all a little bit of a hype. Um, uh, what has happened is that my guru died in 73, but I opened to him in a way that he feels very present in my life. I use him, no longer the form, obviously, but just the quality of a being who I can see sees through it all as like a playmate to hang out with in my mind. He's always chiding me or giggling at me or going like this or loving me. And the qualities of the way he's been with me in the past have touched places in me so deeply that I keep, by keeping him around, I keep getting back to those places. Like I experience this as part of my dialogue with him. All right. Yes. Um, being high seems to involve um, states of consciousness in which you are, um, you are, seeing the design of things and you are connected to the entire, to, to, your, to the unit of experience, but you are not fully experiencing your separateness. You're not fully in your humanity. 
It's where we push away a little bit of the world. It's, the, it's where you make the distinction between the spirit and the world, or the world and the other realms, if you will. Free means where you integrate them, where they're all present all at once, so that this moment between us is all of the things. You and I are meeting in Aspen, and we are also souls that have come to Earth that are figuring out what our journey's about, and it's also God talking to itself, and we're also sitting here in the silence, and the words are just like nothing in the silence. That's all true. See, and as you start to be freer, the, all the planes of reality are present all the time, and you don't keep grabbing at one. And, and in the past, getting high was in somehow getting away from the mundane things of life. And that's the one which you then see isn't free, okay? You're standing on tiptoe, as they say. Question, yes. Well, it's as if, um, it's the same reason why, um, like I take acid every few years. I don't take acid because I think it's going to um, uh, show me new things in the new in the sense of other plans. What I notice is that any method or any practice has certain places in which you socialize it or you hide in it. And then the minute you shift practices, you see where you've been hiding in one practice. Like those kinds of righteousness that come out of doing service or being in the world are so subtle sometimes. And they are traps even though they're very subtle. And sometimes when I go and sit in a meditation and go quieter and quieter, I see the way in which I'll go through the thing of I ought to be doing something. I'll see the way that little clinging is going on. And I'll say, okay, sit some more. I think the highest service is where the, the difference between self and other has disappeared. Gandhi said, when you have surrendered completely to God, you find yourself in the service of all that exists. It becomes your delight and recreation. There's just nothing else. And then at that point, your suffering is our suffering, or the suffering, it's not our, it's the suffering. And the action is the action. And there's no thank you or here, let me help you. That's all gone, that's the highest one. The highest one's where nobody's doing anything, all right? No, no there's no need involved at all. When Maharaj left his body, where did he go? I don't suppose he went anywhere. I mean, I think the body just fell off and got burned up. He still seems around. I haven't gotten rid of him yet. I mean, the nice thing about him is that I don't feel that I can hide from him by being in the United States anymore. <laughs> I mean, he's sort of everywhere. I just feel, I don't feel a form of it. I don't think he went to another plane where he's hanging around like a manual, for example. I think Emmanuel's a nice guy. He's uh, not a guy, a nice being. He's like a nice uncle. Maharaji feels like it just fills uh, everything. I don't know where he is, or I don't even, the coming and going doesn't seem to apply to somebody like that. I don't feel coming and goingness. Now, Maharaji's teachings, I'll show you Maharaji's teachings. I, this is a good example of the, what he did with my heart, the way he played with it. Um, let me give two little examples. They're familiar to those that know my stuff. One is the Volkswagen story. Volkswagen story. I'm with uh, 10 or 12 people. We're in my Volkswagen microbus. We are told we can't visit my guru till the afternoon, so we go to a little temple. On the way back, the Volkswagen won't go up the hill because it's only running on three cylinders. I say, everybody get out and push. Everybody gets out but two women who are sitting in the back who hear me, but they ignore me so they can go on talking. We get out, we push the car up the hill. I'm getting a little bugged with the women, but I don't say anything because I'm a gentleman. We go back to the temple, we walk in. My guru's sitting across the courtyard. He starts to scream as I come in. Ramdas is angry, Ramdas is angry. Everybody says, no, he's been very nice today. No, Ramdas is angry. <laughs> the women wouldn't get out and push, so he said. Okay, cast example one. Example two was in Be Here Now, I think. I went, uh, this was back in 1967 or eight. I went to Delhi. I had been in the temple for four months. I had been fasting, not talking. I was very lean and light was pouring out of my head. I had beads, a long beard, long hair, barefoot. I was wearing a potato sack, Alfie. I came to Delhi to get my visa extended. First time I left the temple. I was so high that I was walking through the Connaught Circus in Delhi. I went in to get 
some envelopes from a stationer and they wouldn't even take money from me because there was so much, you know, tej, so much z -z 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 from me. And I mean, they couldn't take it from somebody like me. And of course, I was enjoying that because partly I was that and partly it was, you know, you know. So it came lunchtime and um, I went to a vegetarian restaurant and um, I sat by the wall here and the people were there. And because there was so much juice in me, um, everybody was watching me. And I was being very yogic and I ordered the right tali, the right food, and, and I ate it in a yogic fashion, which is like, you don't really want it, but you eat. See, part of it's true and part of it's showbiz. I mean, I, I, that's where I am, you know? So I was eating it. I was doing very well and dessert came and it had two biscuits that had cream fillings in it. And I knew it wasn't yogi food. And I knew they knew it wasn't. But inside of this yogi was a, like a fat Jewish adolescent, and he wanted those cookies. There was no, no, no. So I, you know how a magician moves his hand with one hand and then does something with another. So I was like doing this and looking holy with this and moving the, the ice cream over this way with the biscuits. And then I sort of did something that way and I snuck them into my mouth and I got them eaten. And they didn't notice, and I stayed holy. And I got on the night bus, which was eight hours back up to the mountain. I got back up to the mountain, bought some apples, went to see my guru, kneel down in front of him. He grabbed the back of my hair, pulled me up, came down. He said, how'd you like the biscuits? Okay. <laughs> now, he kept doing that to me, and it was like dropping water on stone. It was just one after another, after another, after another. And one day, I was sitting in front of him. And he was talking to other people, and I was sitting there, and I thought, boy, he really knows everything in my mind. He knows everything in all these people's mind. And it hit me, and I thought, oh my God, he knows everything in my mind. And suddenly, it's like, don't think rhinoceros, you know? All the things you would never think in front of your teacher were pouring through my mind. I mean, stuff that I wouldn't even... And I was so... I turned red. He was right there, you know? And I... I was covering my face with my hands, and when I finally looked through my fingers at him, you know, he was about this far from me, and he was looking at me with such love, such total love, just like, ah. Oh. And it was like he was appreciating a tree. He wasn't judging it. He was just appreciating it. And the quality of that, the way he did that, what it left me with was the feeling of, wouldn't it be wonderful if I was could be grace to be that kind of a person who could love somebody enough to free them that way. That's the way I felt. And that was like, the way he gave a teaching was just that simple. Just that simple. And then he'd say, Jiao, get lost, split. Always throw you out, throw you out. And there was no teaching in which he said, this will happen after death, this is where you'll go, this is anything. He gave me much support for my feeling about reincarnation and also about the whole dream sequence of it. Like, you know, am I a puppet? All those kind of things. Just those kind of little asides that made it all seem so empty and yet so precious at the same moment. Questions? Um, my sense is that the way in which we are all interconnected means that all of the little efforts that are made, are they summate in the sense of collective consciousness. Like, I spent a day in Iowa with the Great Peace March, the anti-nuclear march that was walking across the United States. And there were 600 people who every day walked 17 to 20 miles and then uh, made camp. And they had huge trailers with all this stuff. They had to set up a kitchen and a camp every night and then go on. And they met the mayors in each town and they planted trees. And, and I felt they were upset because they weren't getting more media coverage. And I said to them, I understand that. But at the same moment, the upset you're feeling is also part of the message you're making. And you've got to use the peace march such that by the time you finish the march, you are the peace march that everything you do is a statement of it. Gandhi was on a train leaving a station and a reporter rushed in and said, Mahatmaji, give me a message to take back to the people. Gandhi scribbled on a paper bag and handed it out and said, my life is my message. And in a way, 
It's the way we do it, the way you talk to somebody in the coffee shop. It's the way you do the thing. It's the way you make a march. It's that. I'm not sure there is an action. There is the collectivity of the hearts that say, enough of this. And that's, I don't think people should underestimate that quality of, it feels to me that when somebody is able to speak the truth without attachment, it resonates at the deepest places in people's hearts. They know it's the truth and they will act in response to it. And it feels to me that we are not yet able to hear the clearest truth about all this. And that we have to keep working on ourselves to keep hearing deeper and deeper truths. We can't wait till we are fully enlightened to act. So we do whatever appears around. The reason, for example, that I went to my first anti-nuclear thing was because uh, I was speaking in Boulder and Allen Ginsberg called me and he said, I can't be there in the, the group of Buddhists meditating. Would you go and sit with them? I said, sure. And I went and immediately it felt just right to, to do. And from then on, when people would say, would you? Do? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. In a way, I feel like I, I had an interesting experience the other day. There's a man named Dr. Charles Hyder, you may know. He's sitting across from the White House fasting doing a water fast. He has now fasted for 167 or eight days. He started 300 pounds. He now weighs 150 pounds. He's an astrophysicist from, uh, from uh, New Mexico. And um, he just decided he would make the statement of his life. He didn't expect, he made a set of uh, decisions of that the bomb would be, the bombs would be dismantled by the year 2000 and certain things would happen along the way. And he just said, I'll make this statement. He got rid of his possessions. He got his kids to understand and he's doing it. And um, the other day I got a message saying that Dr. Hyder wanted to speak to me. I've never met him. So I called the number I was given and this is a far out experience. And I, I said, um, hello, uh, I was told to call Bob or somebody about speaking to Dr. Hyder. My name is Ramdas. And he said, well, they're not here, but just a minute. Phone was put down and I sat there and then I heard breathing on the other end of the phone. So I said, this is Ram Das. And then there was about three minutes when we just, when I just sat there, just feeling being with somebody else. And then the phone was hung up. So I went away from that thinking, do you think I just created the breathing? Maybe the phone was put down and they couldn't find anybody and somebody else came along and hung it up, you know? I mean, I don't know. But it felt like something, but I wasn't sure. And I thought, this is one of those things in life where you never know. You just did what you did. The other day I was speaking in Albuquerque and a guy came up to me and he said, I just wanted to thank you for being with Dr. Hyder on the phone. He said that after about three minutes, he just broke up in smiles and hung up and the business was done. Now, it's interesting, like that little thing of just the, so would you call? I called, we made that contact. Whatever I could offer, I offered at that moment. I think each of us hears from day to day, just, you're right, you gave the answer, which way we manifest. I, I did this set of dialogues with Dan Ellsberg. Um, in fact, we actually prepared a manuscript based on the, on the things. And it was about to be published when Dan decided he didn't want to publish with me because he felt that I was undermining his position because he was speaking based on fear and urgency. And um, that's the delicate one, to keep your eye on the mark that, that the that nuclear proliferation is completely off the wall and that you have to do what you can to bring that other shift of consciousness and at the same moment not get lost in your emotional reactions about it, because that's the one that screws up the thing. And all I can feel is, like I remember walking in the uh, June 12th thing in New York City at the United Nations when we all uh, did that huge march. Right after that, my friend Casper said that night, he said, we will not let a street scene affect our policy. That's what he said, there were, I don't know, three quarters of a million of us or something like that walking around the United Nations. But the fact of the matter is, it does affect our policy. And it is slowly, the whole consciousness is shifting just by degrees, just by degrees. As Jerry Brown once said to me, the ship of state turns slowly. And I can feel that happening, just this shift. So I say, we keep doing dropping water on stone, water on stone, water on stone. You know, I, 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 I,
Yeah. And this, and the second? Great, I thought that was the first one. <laughs> the answer is, I think the statement God, guru, and self are the same thing, first of all. I think that, that you, for most people, the spiritual guidance comes from inside, from their intuitive hearts, and that they don't have an external form. There are a lot of hypey people that say they're gurus and they're obviously not. They, you know, they're hung up just like everybody else. There are a lot of teachers. Teachers point the way. Gurus sort of are the way because they're not anybody. There's nobody there. I mean, I could never figure out who my guru was, whether he was a hype or whether he was real. And I don't know whether he was just a dirty old man that conned me or not. See, I never know any of that stuff. That's the beauty of a guru. You know, they don't sit around like just emanating light and being guruness. They're just, uh, they're constantly taking and playing with your mind. Um, I didn't find him. He found me. I was brought to him. I thought I was just in a car going somewhere else. That's what I thought I was doing. No, in India. And uh, I was kind of hung over from too much hashish. I was in a row a car I didn't want to be in with somebody I didn't really want to be with. I wanted to go back to America. I had dysentery. And the whole thing was a drag. I thought Indian Hinduism was very kitsch. It had too much fluorescent light and calendar art. I wanted Buddhism because it was very tight and I really liked that. And I just, this fellow had to go to see his guru. And I just was in the car and I stopped by the side of the road and I met this guy. And within about an hour, I was sobbing my heart out for days. And, hmm? See, the thing is, the rational mind is constantly saying this. The rational mind, but the rational mind, it's interesting because there was a time later when I was traveling with Swami Muktananda, who was a really nice guy. And um, we traveled all, I was his warm-up man and his road man all over Australia and Singapore. We played all those places. And um, at one point, I came back to his ashram and the people said, he's treating you so wonderfully. You should stay here. He's your real guru. And he had furs and Mercedes, and he gave me a servant, and oh, and I had a throne next to his throne. And he had thousands of people coming and giving me coconuts and putting flowers around my neck. I mean, it was really heavy duty. And I had somebody to iron my doties. And God, it was a real scene. And I said to them, you know, if I had my choice, I'd trade gurus in a second, you know, because rationally, this is a much better deal. <laughs> But there's no way, it has nothing to do with my mind. It's a total matter of my heart. I'm stuck with this old slob up in the mountains. I can't get rid of him, what am I gonna do? And that's the way I feel. I feel it's beyond all my mind. I couldn't care. I mean, he says stuff that's completely off the wall and it doesn't make any difference. You mean from my perspective of age, is that what you're asking? <laughs> Well, I'm not 55, first of all. It's only my body that's 55. My Volvo is about 10 years old. And his body's 55. I'm just here. Um, it feels to me like uh, a lot of us, through whatever means, whether it was chemical or whatever, existential conditions, experienced something of the realm of the possible, and we started to look for systems that would help us understand these. And the systems that were most readily available were in the East. And so we were drawn to those. As we got established in those systems, then many of us came back and found that in the Western systems, in the more esoteric components of them, were the same truths. But we hadn't been able to see them because we had only been presented the exoteric parts of those systems, like the Judeo-Christian tradition. Okay? Um, I further see that a lot of the wisdom that, was, that emerged out of the East then got spread very deeply into this culture through a lot of ways, like, for example, through the lyrics of rock and roll music, etc., into a lot of consciousness, so that it is much more part of the zeitgeist now than it was before, so that there is less need, in a way, for people to go there to get that. It's more available here and more available in forms that aren't as traditional, if you will, okay? Um, so it feels to me like the East-West dialogue, there was a moment where there was a tremendous transfusion or infusion of that. I now feel it's established in this culture. I think there is a tremendous need for deeper practices in this culture. 
and I honor the purest strains that do that, but I don't feel that any longer is it an East-West issue. I think it's an issue of, um, if you will, esoteric or exoteric, or things that allow transcendence of dualism versus not. Because most exoteric Western religions don't allow for transcendence of dualism. To say you're God is just incredible chutzpah, you know. <laughs> Sir? First of all, I don't think there's an end of the process. I think the means, this is the end of the process. There's nowhere to go. This is it. It's just an ongoing thing. It keeps continuing. And as we get clearer and lighter, then we are more of an environment for each other where other people can get clear or light through us. I don't in any way aspire to a model. I don't have a model of achievement in this game. I don't th that would be one I'd leave behind along the way. See, it says in the third Chinese patriarch of Zen, even to be attached to the idea of enlightenment is to go astray. See, and finally, you're doing what you're doing because you're doing what you're doing because there's nothing else to do. And then it just gets thicker and richer and more simple and more in the moment and more immediate. Now, other people may then say, you are a guru or you're my guru. That's their problem. From your, my guru never said he was a guru. He never said I was a disciple. He never bought any of that stuff. I mean, he, it was all nonsense from his point of view. Because each person finally has to find their own enlightenment. Nobody does it to anybody else. He didn't, he's not doing it to me. He is merely an environment in which I can do it to myself as I am ready to do it to myself. So that I don't have any aspiration of being somebody that can zap people and bring them to enlightenment. I don't have any of that. You know? I, feel I, I feel that as time goes on, you leave less footprints on the sand and you become in a way more and more irrelevant. I feel I'll just kind of disappear. I may still be doing forms like this, but I won't be here. It's just rent around us. <laughs> I think that um, right here at Snowmass, for example, there are a group of people doing uh, deep practices around the, the heart of Christ and, the, and quieting through spiritual practices in that tradition. I think I was the other last week, I was at the 92nd Street Y in New York with Reb Zalman Schachter. And we were talking about Hasidism and, uh, and uh, Kabbalistic studies. Those are certainly available now. I, I'm doing retreats all summer where this summer I'm really just saying, okay, let's start to meditate more deeply. Let's do more chanting. Let's do more silence. Let's be alone more. Let's get on with it. Let's go profound. Let's dig deeper into ourselves. We're ready for a little more now. We're ready to use service as a way of lightening our consciousness. And that's part of what I'm learning how to do myself and try to share with other people. Um, the zikr practice in Sufism, there are lots of these practices around, I think. Okay. Yeah, I'm doing one at La I'm doing one May 1st in Pisa, Italy for 10 days at a Buddhist monastery. And I'm doing Lama end of July, Omega end of June. Omega, middle of July, that's in New York State. Brightonbush, middle of August, that's in north of Portland, Oregon. Then um, um, Roe Mass in September, and then Esalen in October. Okay. Then I'm gonna retire. <laughs> yes. It's the same statement that I said before, my life is my message. What you offer to your mother is your being, and whatever of this stuff you have become is what you offer her. And you hang out, when you think you have to give her teachings, watch out, okay? It's interesting that you just offer. There was this fellow that was at a Zen monastery in San Francisco, and he flipped out, and his parents put him in a hospital. And then he'd go, go weekend leaves, and he'd call me on the weekends and swear at me, which I knew meant he loved me. and. Um, I said, how are you doing at home? He says, when I, his, he was from a Jewish family in Cleveland. He said, well, he said, when I talk about Buddhism, they hate it, but when I am the Buddha, they don't mind it at all. Okay. And it's the same thing, that to the extent that you are afraid of death, no matter what you say, you're conveying partly that fear. And to the extent that you think that there's an error in the fact that your stepfather is dying, is, and to the extent that you're holding grudge or you can't see his beauty, that's what you're conveying. So your work on yourself is your own work about your own fear of death, your own 
anger towards him or just, you know, judgment about him and your own wanting to do something to your mother to change her state. Those are all traps. And so you use the situation of being with her to work on yourself about all those to extricate yourself so you can just be with her. Is that fair enough? We have to stop, everybody. It's 11.15 and the this turns back into a pumpkin. Um, just to one observation is it just feels to me incredible grace that we have enough in our bellies and we have a shelter and that we have a political system that even allows us to come together to do this. I mean, in the history of humankind, of civilizations, this is reasonably rare. And with all the problems it's got, it's still very special. And it doesn't mean we should feel guilty because we have and there are have nots. It means we should understand our part and listen to hear our unique part. And we do this as a way of offering back into the world whatever wisdom we glean from the work we do in ourselves. In India, when we meet and part, we say namaste, which means I honor the place in you where when you're in yours and I'm in mine, there's only one of us. Namaste. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.